Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. I really appreciate your coming in. Thank you, thank you. I wish I would have known Chinese because I got on the wrong train in China once and ended up in the wrong city. And that was not fun. So study Chinese if you're going to go to China. Um, I'm a filmmaker by trade. I always done that ever since I was 16 or 17 years old. Um, I usually kid saying that I don't know how to do anything else. Um, there were no film schools back then where I was living, uh, which was in Buenos Aires, Argentina. Uh, there were no film schools. In fact, the first film schools were created or founded by people that started making films with me at that time. And uh, there was a serious film industry, conservative film industry, just like in the United States, in Hollywood, and in Mexico. The three largest film industries in the Americas were the one in Hollywood, then Mexico, and then Buenos Aires. Uh, but because of the political upfield of the last 50 years, that kind of went sour. And the independent filmmakers movement came back, came up, started in the 60s. Those are the people that I admired. And I thought there was nothing cooler than walking around with a camera that you had to crank. Just the sound of the bollocks. Just the sound of the crank and then the release and you have no idea how to match the sound with the image. And they were really cool. They, they smoked cigarettes, they, <laughs> they drank whiskey. And it was a different time. And, um, and so first I walked into the film because I loved the artifacts. I just loved the cameras and the sound and the people and the lifestyle. And then I realized that that became very instrumental in the political changes of that generation. You can use the film to do things and to tell stories that otherwise would not be heard. This is before color television. Television was a commodity, not everybody had one. And the radio was in the hands of the state. So if you wanted to tell the story about someone or a particular issue or a, or a strike or a farmer's issue or social issue, um, you will resort to documentaries. And I fell in love with documentaries. I've been doing that ever since. I survived color television, uh, and I kept doing, making films, and then cable came along, and then the iPad and the iPhone, and there's always room for documentaries because curiosity is endless. So as long as you know your trade and you know how to make the documentary, which is not something necessarily that you're gonna learn in film school. Film school is gonna teach you how to, how to put together film and sound. Or in, like in the case of Soledad, she studied for, six, for four, five years, six years. Semantics of film, a narrative of film, well, that's the intellectual side of the films. Mine is the more practical, the one-on-one. -on -one. And I went from social issues that I was very much interested to cultural issues. I made films on the carnival, on the origins of carnival and samba in Brazil. Films about the uh, actual uh, relationships between uh, the two main tribes in, in the northern part of, in the southern part of Bolivia, in the Altiplano. And um, I made films in Mexico. I made a film in China, when I got lost, remember that. And, uh, but I'm mostly today interested in people, institutions, and buildings. I think that buildings have a story to tell. I don't have anything to show you on buildings. I'm going to show you a short film on, on an individual. But I'm going to tell you about the building that I'm working on, which is Brown College. It's very interesting because we know very little about what Brown College original set of administrative offices that we know, that white, white L-shaped elephant up there in the hill that people see, but they don't know exactly what it is. And it has an extraordinary history, which we know now, 
because of the initiative of Professor Plaskin, in fact, that got together with us and we decided to start digging into the past to find out what came first, the chicken or the egg, what was here first, Brown College or the University of Virginia? Well, neither one. It was a farm, the, one of the first farms in Albemarle County, which was the farm of James Monroe. And we've been working for the past eight months on that film, and we're treating the house as if it was an individual. We're letting the house talk, the tax records talking, the eyewitness accounts that we can read, the historic records, and then something that is very hi, something that is very unusual for my short experience at UVA as well, which is the interdisciplinary collaboration. You don't see much of that. Sadly, because but on the other hand, you, you can't really uh, um, criticize that set of circumstances that much because everybody is running after their schedules and their times and, their, and, and, and what they need to do and, and filing for grants and, and there's not much time for chit-chatting. And sometimes, like in this documentary, I think that the greatest lesson that I've learned, you there, Stephen? The, uh, the greatest lesson I've learned in this documentary that we're doing about the history of Brown College that I hope that you all have a chance to see on November 6th at the film festival is working across, not across the aisle, but across the many aisles. walking across the swamp, getting the editor of the James Monroe papers, talking to the editor of the Madison papers, which never talked to the editor of the George Washington papers, which never talked to the head of the history department. So trying to get them all together into one table. The table doesn't exist, it's an imaginary table. The table is my editing room. I get them to talk on the screen, and that's what I think is interesting. Um, one last mention before, oh, I have to put that. Um, where was I? Fashion. Where? Fashion. No, oh, Barajola. Okay, I'm sorry. This is it. I was going to show something different. This is an interesting case. When I first came to the university about four years ago, I met this physicist with whom I used to get in a lot of arguments about ethics. He was a member of the Cassini mission for NASA. And, and we really got into really sick arguments. I mean, we would throw things at each other. <laughs> and, uh, and one day we went to uh, the cemetery here at UVA, because I was interested in checking some graves, and we started chasing each other in the cemetery. And, and then I decided to make a movie about him because I thought he was an extraordinary man, a man worth arguing with. If, if I don't have any advice, but if I have one would be, don't argue with anybody that is not worth it. And arguments are good, as long as the other, the person in front of you is worth it. And this man was worth it. I say this was because he died this year. And, um, and when he died, the film was vindicated in a sense because our arguments, our discussions, our conversations were left in this film. Uh, I'm not there in presence, in, in, in body, image, or voice, 
or sound, but I am there as long as I am the one who concocted, concocted his vision. I am the one who put together this film, so I picked and chose what of him I wanted to show. So in a sense, the Professor Varajola that you're going to see on the screen now is the one that I had in my mind. So let me show you this film and then we, we can have some questions going back and forth. It's short, sweet, and I hope you like it. Censorship. <laughs> We're accustomed to think and then it gets. What is that? The uh, buffering? Yeah. Probably the. Let me take the HD off. Yeah, so including the whole time, time, which is uh, what a lot of people think. That may be because we're accustomed to thinking that everything we see has a beginning and an end. That maybe things don't have a beginning and an end. Maybe there is a a universe out there where all the times are possible and all the spaces are possible. And just what we do not have is the ability to, uh, to go through paths in that, in that universe to, to look for different things. Yeah, you cannot look for your grandfather in there if you don't know how to do that. <laughs> My name is Raul Barajola. I was born in 1945 in Argentina, in the city of Santa Fe. It's, uh, coming from a family of immigrants. My grand, grand grandfather came from Italy. He was hired to expand the, uh, the frontier as a, as a blacksmith. He came to Santa Fe. He did that, take him to the Indians. Uh, the, the side of my mother, it was more uh, comfortable because they were uh, uh, industrialists. Uh, they came to put a, a sparkling water factory or something. So I was born in, in my family. Uh, it was a, a rather intellectual family. My parents were uh, accountants, and my father taught uh, at the university mathematics and economics. He would uh, give public lectures on. on music, classical music, and uh, he gave me the uh, love for astronomy and, uh, and science and everything that uh, and philosophy. When I was uh, 17, I went to the University of Cordoba to study engineering, but then I got a scholarship to go to the United States to the last year in high school, so I went to Milwaukee, Wisconsin. I spent the last year in, in high school there, and, and there I gravitated towards uh, uh, exploring all kinds of other things. I was in the forensics lab, so I, when I came back to Argentina, my, my life had changed. Then I went back to uh, study engineering, and uh, at some point, I learned about this physics institute in, in Bariloche, which was a uh, uh, top level and it was hard to get in, so it was a challenge and so forth. And by that time, I had already applied for a, a Fulbright uh, fellowship to get to 
to do college in the United States, I uh, wanted to go to MIT. And at some point I had to decide. And I decided for Bariloche because it was physics and physics is what I liked. So in the 1970s, with the military dictatorship that came, uh, it was a big shock. And I started working on trying to do some, in a way, community work for my profession. I was a uh, member of uh, uh, the delegate of the uh, professional association, the Atomic Energy Commission, Bariloche. And I tried to help people who were being persecuted by the by the government. I was I was uh, 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 very much interested in this question of the nuclear free world, and that came. Uh, when I read Bertrand Russell in, uh, in the early 60s, and he had said uh, that one should ask not whether we should uh, use a, it was, was listed to use a nuclear bomb in a war, but rather <clears throat> whether it was listed to make a war knowing that nuclear bomb could be uh, used. And that thing was it stuck with me. And since then I, I was a uh, an anti-war activist. And so at that point, it was being against the nuclear submarine that some people wanted to do in the Atomic Energy Commission. And then it was against the uh, secret plan to do enriched uranium near Bariloche. And so in 1988, I, I guess I fall in disgrace with the uh, powers, and I, I came to United States. First, uh, uh, we, uh, we went to uh, Rutgers in New Jersey, uh, a good place, but crowded. And then I looked for a, a permanent job. There I was a visiting professor. A permanent job, and uh, there were options between Texas and coming to the University of Virginia. So finally, the decision was to come to the University of Virginia. We're going to leave it at that, just a little bit more so you can see this shot because I love it. <laughs> I was being interviewed to come to uh, Because you can see this on Vimeo, I want to give you the link so we can take more time to talk. Um, as, as I was revisiting this film, I noticed two things. One is that I'm interested in people and I'm also interested in spaces. But spaces are made by people. So both are one and the same in a sense, and sometimes more than others. You cannot understand who truly changed Monroe was if you do not understand that what we know today as his law office here, part of the administrative buildings of Brown College, was his first home. He lived in all the homes before, but this is the one that he built for the first time. So we're talking about a father founder, someone who founded, was part of the, of the group of, of, uh, of people who founded the nation, building his first home, his relationships with the slaves, his relationships with the revolution. Um, all of that talks about the space, and the space cannot be interpreted if you don't understand who made it. And you cannot understand who made it without visiting the places where they live. That's why we feel sort of a kinship, and we tend to like to, to commute to 
do the pilgrimage to the place where so-and-so lived. That's why those places are important, not just because of the walls, but because who lived there. So there's a symbiotic relationship between the space and the individual who built it and lived there and dreamed about it. Technically speaking, I want to say that I did this film with my, by myself with a camera. Were you there when we did the sound? No. no. This film, for example, is a good example that you don't have any excuses to make a film. You don't need a crew. You don't need money. You just have to have the will and the determination to make it. And then you have to have the knowledge. You have to learn the rules so you can break them. <laughs> but my favorite part is to break the rules. But you have to learn them first, get to know them by heart. So this film was, I did the camera, this sound. I was alone with him all the time. And then it was edited by myself. And any of you here can do it. And it doesn't have to be your profession. But it could be, for example, an aid to whatever it is that you do. If you're going to be working on an oil firm in Saudi Arabia, to have the capacities to record your contact, your interaction with the people where you're living for a short period of time, if it doesn't help you then to understand what is going on, believe me, it's going to help you down the road. Because when I look at this footage now, I understand things about Barajola that I did not understand when, when we used to chase each other in the cemetery. Um, it takes time to understand what happened. And film is a beautiful, extraordinary instrument, just as photography. I'm not minimizing photography, and sometimes it's easier to achieve. Um, it's a great tool to understand where you were yesterday and where you're going to be tomorrow. Now let's open it for questions. Why are they also known to you? Danny, a chance maybe to say a few words about working with you? Oh, yes. Daniel, you want to step up? Come here. He had to leave. Let's see, who else is here? I'm not seeing every. Oh, okay. One of the things, let me introduce you. Uh, come here, come over. Who else is here from the crew? Uh, had to okay. One of the things that Soledad and I wanted to make sure, and, and I think we, we share this in spirit with, with Principal Melissa and with Stephen Plaskin, that we wanted as many students involved in the process of making it. Because precisely, of the fact that so many former brownies and proto-brownies, because there were residents here before this was called Brown College, um, didn't know about this space, didn't know what this was. And um, so we wanted some of the students to get engaged at every level that they could. It was hard, because during the summer many of them weren't here. And during the regular um, uh, semesters, sometimes it's difficult because of their tasks. But why don't you tell us first what was your involvement and what you thought about of the experience? Um, OK, well, I, uh, last spring, was the unit production manager. Um, and now Katie Dudgeon, for those of you who've met her, is now the unit production manager for the rest of the project. Um, and I think. What interests me most, and now I'm a media studies and American studies, so what I really learned from this project, and what I was hoping to learn from this project, is that I'm very interested in film rhetoric. And so for those of you who may not know what that is, is for many people, there's a film that really touches them in some way. It makes them feel amazing. It makes them understand something else about themselves. Like, for me, it's The Breakfast Club. I'm an 80s <laughs> movie fan, so. Um, but, most of us have that movie that really means something to us. And just by working on a project, I've learned a lot about that feeling. And as you can see, Eduardo Montes Bradley has, you know, I think given us all a, a love of Monroe Hill and James Monroe himself and the things that he's done and accomplished. And hello, I'm 
Daniel Manestrand. I work as a, one of the two research assistants with Eduardo. Um, I have a student research assistant, um, which mainly involved going through letters and documents that were written by or to James Monroe. Um, and I think for me, the thing that was most interesting was reading some of these letters and documents that weren't intended for um, public consumption at the time that they were written. And one of the reasons was Interesting point. Yeah, they, um, they sort of showed, I think, an element of who the people actually were. And, and it reminded me that when we read about these people or see documentaries about these people, that they were actual human beings and they, I mean, they lived here just the same way that we live here. And some of the things that they dealt with were very similar to things that we deal with now. And so it was really fascinating to me being a good part of this project to see just how these people were Really? I would like to, to, to share maybe an anecdote that points out in that direction. I, I received some of the letters that we missed because there is six volumes of the correspondence. It's impossible to absorb all that. And um, there were, um, come closer. Come closer. <laughs> and, um, and there were some letters that we missed. And there was an argument that I didn't, it didn't, I didn't buy it. In August of 1794, James Monroe, living here, there, goes to Paris as minister, meaning ambassador, in the midst of the revolution. Uh, they almost decapitated the minister before him. And, and he comes to France, and there's a bunch of Americans in jail, some about to be executed, including Thomas Paine, and the wife of the Marquis de Lafayette. So Jefferson arrives, and what I hear from all the experts is the standard narrative. And what is the standard narrative says? It says that James Monroe's wife gets dressed, puts her best dress, rents a buggy, goes to the jail to see and visit with the wife of Marquis de Lafayette, and everybody on the street said, who is this lady coming to see whom? Of course, word got to the uh, high powers of the government in France at the time, and when they noticed that the American government were, was, had some interest in this woman who was about to be decapitated, in fact, her two sisters and her mother was decapitated, were decapitated a month before, and she was on guillotine row, they let her go. Well, I don't buy it. Doesn't make any sense to me. First of all, one of the greatest diplomats of our time, of that time, and, and of this nation was Monroe. He, he sold, you know, the Louisiana Purchase, and you know, um, it, it's the ambassador in, in, in France, in England, in, in Spain. It's, it's, it's a very interesting character. So the affair with Madame Lafayette completely slipped his mind, and his wife just sneaked out of the house, went to visit and solved it. We found the letters two days ago, which William Ferraro, the uh, curator and editor of the George Washington papers, not the, the, uh, the Monroe papers, that's when I talked about uh, you know, interdisciplinary collaboration, sent me the letters of Madame Lafayette, in which Madame Lafayette thanks Mr. Monroe for what he did, not Mrs. Monroe. So now everything makes sense to me. What happened is Mr. Monroe cannot go to Monsieur de Lacroix and say, could you please let Madame Lafayette go, because that would be interfering in the internal affairs of the French Revolution. You don't want to do that. You don't want to go and directly ask for it. So you create a diplomatic situation, circumstance, that will favor your intentions, your goal. And what, what did he do? He sat down with his wife and says, we got to do this. So this is my plan. Are you in or you're out? And of course she was in, because she was also a friend of Madame Lafayette. So they both, in a way, did it together. But the problem is that the tendency is to try to create as many 
um, individual individual heroes and heroines. This, this, this all has to do with the political correctness that we mentioned before. Uh, we cannot leave Madame uh, Monroe in the shadows. But unfortunately, she was not a protagonist of that particular event. And that shows in the letters. So it was a pleasure for me to have these guys here, you and Ben Camber, and who else worked on the, on the letters? Basically, two of you, right? Most of the two of us, I think. Going through these letters, scanning for information, and then double checking that information with, what we, with the tax, property tax records that we found in. So as you can see, in filmmaking process, there's a lot of boring stuff. But for me, it's a lot of fun. Then you get the camera and you tell the story. So there's many ways to tell a story. There's many ways to tell a film. But now let's go to the questions, right? Absolutely. Do we have time? Yeah, we do. We have time for yeah. several questions about the creative process, about the research. Obviously, you talked about the technique and the importance of the rhetoric of the film. You talked about the research that goes into this. You talked about the direction and the necessity of understanding place and being in place. And I will tell you, <clears throat> Going into the law office, which you all are going to do at some point here. We can't all do this together because it is not a huge space. But I even remember when Eduardo came in for the first time. The positive energy that is in that building is so important. It's palatable. You can feel it. You need to be there. You need to experience that. And as soon as Eduardo experienced that, he knew that there was a story here that needed to be told. And that's the beauty of this whole process of filmmaking and the creative power that um, Eduardo sees in film and what you can accomplish and do with it. Okay, so there are 12 people here in Brown who have been involved in this film. I can name all of them for you, I'm not gonna do that right now, but we will point people out at various points that have all done something with this from carrying camera equipment, holding batteries, right? <laughs> holding up uh, microphones and uh, just watching equipment while you guys have been running around doing things, uh, going you know, into various locations to find tombstones and grave sites, et cetera. Oh, that was fun. Yeah, <laughs> and we are not done yet. Um, is there not going to be some uh, maybe involvement of students in general? You had mentioned something about a, a scene. Maybe oh, we're all going to Richmond, and because most of, the, most of the things that we did as part of the research, um, we're going to reenact them now and try to pretend that, it, that it's at the time that it was happening. The problem is that when it was happening, we didn't know. And that is the way that I like to work, because if you carry your camera with you spontaneously, on the first time, you might end up with 17 hours of film, which is a nightmare. So by the end, what I do is I take all the information that I have, I put it on the timeline when I'm editing, and then I only know that I need three seconds of this, five seconds of that, one minute of this, the car passing under the bridge, the guys walking into the library, and I can do that in half a day. And another thing that, I'm sorry, that is, I think it's very important is, one of the things that I felt when I was doing this film is that I was, in a modest way, providing future generations of students at Brown, yourselves now that come here for the first time, with a background history on the place. One that is gonna make you feel proud that you're coming here, that you're living here, and that you're sharing 250 years of history. Uh, when James Monroe laid the cornerstone of Pavilion 7, which is right there in the academic village, which was the first cornerstone of the University of Virginia, he had a clear view to his law office up in the hill. So, he was here 30 years before the university started. So you guys are living in the, what I called in the film, the cradle of the University of Virginia. If I can transmit with my film on November 6, this sense of pride to you all as parts of a community larger than yourselves, not in present terms, but in historical, value, then I think we have accomplished something here. Absolutely. 
And the reason we wanted to kick off with Eduardo and Soledad and the film crew is that you know who these people are so that you can talk to them in the weeks before we preview the film and screen the film on November 7th. If you're interested in the history of Monroe Hill, you have go-to people. If you're interested in the process of the making of the film, you have go-to people. So there's a richness in all of this, and I hope you will capitalize on this opportunity. So along those lines, so that you do know, we do have certainly a token of our appreciation for you coming in and speaking today, which is the official Brown College water bottle. <laughs> <laughs> Can I can I put whiskey here? Uh, it's your water bottle. That's all I know. Okay. I only know it's water bottle. It's perfect for Lucille. But, but silly. wait, there's more. Wait, there's more. So I mentioned, you know, your opportunity to meet with them and get together with them. So we wanted to surprise Eduardo and Solo that extent because they have done so much for us and they are doing so much for us. We wanted to make them community fellows. So I am very pleased to be able to present to you tonight your official community fellow Thank you. badge. All right, your Thank official you so community much. fellow badge, which you will wear so that you can rec be recognized um, at the appropriate time. And we have for you your dining card privileges because we expect you so to be <laughs> in the dining room. Thank you. Because remember, all we can do is an introduction today to this huge thing that we are doing. And you know now who they are. When you see them in the dining room, please sit with them, talk with them, chat with them. And I know you will have questions for them. So what we're going to do in the interest of time is we do need to end at this particular point. I know you have a big little thing going on here in about 15 or 20 minutes. You're all supposed to assemble at 515. And we will then see you at the banquet. Uh, we are going to occupy them for a bit, and then we will also be at the banquet. So please, say hello, talk with us. Thank you all for being here. I need you to know that next week so we have the ice cream truck, but that not, should not be the reason that you come to the back today. <laughs> but keep that in mind. We have John Schrupp from the Office of Emergency Preparedness and Jim Lamb, his associate, uh, former associate, and you're going to learn about emergency preparedness here at the university and the FBI. Everything you wanted to know about hostage negotiations. So I look forward to seeing you. Let's give them a round of applause.